This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm your host, Mac Pritchard. I'm also the founder of Max List. It's a job board in the Pacific Northwest that helps you find a fulfilling career. Every Wednesday, I talk to a different expert about the tools you need to get the work you want. Find Your Dream Job is brought to you by Top Resume. Top Resume has helped more than 400,000 professionals land more interviews and get hired faster. Get a free review of your resume today. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. You see the perfect job and your background makes you the ideal candidate. How do you make the most of your experiences and skills when you apply and interview for the position? Ashton McMillan is here to talk about how to use leverage to get the job you want. He's a recruiter with experience in leadership and financial analysis who specializes in software engineering and technical positions. Ashton joins us from Saginaw, Michigan. Well, let's jump right into it, Ashton. We're talking about how to use leverage to get the job you want. Let's start with definitions. How do you define leverage when you're looking for work? Great question, Mac. Um, I think the way that I define leverage um, is anything that is a part of, you know, my background or someone else's background uh, that gives them a leg up uh, against the competition and any other candidates uh, that may be looking for the same job. Uh, It could be something as simple as uh, working in the same industry for the job that you're applying to uh, or something as complex as, um, you know, the exact type of tools or resources that they use uh, in the environment that you're hoping to work for. Do you think, Ashton, that most candidates understand the leverage that's available to them? They they have a good understanding of what their competitive advantages are? Uh, Yeah, Mac. I think for the most part, uh, when people, you know, go to look for jobs and apply for jobs, you know, they um, clearly have a a good understanding of their background. Uh, But I do, I I will say that, you know, here recently due to, you know, the the gaps in the labor market, um, that that has become a little bit more hazy uh, in in identifying, you know, hey, uh, what skills and abilities do I have uh, that align perfectly uh, with the job? And I think that's twofold. Uh, One, on the candidate's end, uh, you know, when you wake up to a layoff email or a layoff Zoom call that you weren't expecting, uh, it, it tends to, you know, take a jab at your confidence a little bit. Uh, and I would say uh, the second part of that is uh, on the employers as well, you know, making sure that they're taking the time uh, to really define who it is that they're looking for. Uh, you know, if you tell me to go look for somebody who has a red shirt, you know, I'll find you somebody, right? But if you tell me to look for somebody who's in a red shirt, blue jeans, black shoes, and, and, a, and a skull cap, then, you know, that that's more clearly defining uh, who it is that, you know, that person that, or that employer is looking for. So um, I do believe for the most part, they do understand that. But uh, recently, it's become a little bit more of a gray area uh, just due to uh, the state of the labor market and the fact that there are more uh, people looking for jobs uh, than there are uh, jobs to, to be had out there. What stops employers from being as specific as you just outlined uh, with your two examples? What It would seem to be in a hiring manager's advantage to, to, to be as specific as possible. What what stops uh, employers from doing that, Ashton? Yeah, and, and I think you you hit the nail right on the head there, Mac. Uh, it all starts with the hiring manager. Uh, one of the scenarios and, and examples that I've seen of where um, you know the the employer may be a little bit you know hazier or have a gray area when it comes to exactly who they're looking for um, is uh, on the hiring manager and them not you know being very clearly defined uh, and really knowing what they're looking for. Uh, sometimes, if a hiring manager is a really great technical person or a technical fit for the job, or maybe they've been with the organization for a very long time uh, and was just kind of, you know, naturally promoted into that position, uh, that may cause them to not be the best people manager. Uh, and if you're not the best people manager, nine times out of the 10, then you don't know uh, who it is that you're looking for. And so uh, obviously that's one of the examples. Um, there's probably many other reasons why, but that's the, the primary one that I have the most experience with. Well, let's talk about how candidates can use leverage to get the job uh, they want. And one of your first tips is to read the entire job description, uh, not just the job title. How does doing this give you leverage? 
Yes. So reading the entire job description, uh, gives a candidate leverage, uh, because believe it or not, Mac, uh, from someone who's been a recruiter or, you know, in the talent space for, you know, almost five years now, uh, it would surprise you, uh, at how many people don't even know, uh, what the company does or the industry that they're in, uh, that they're looking to apply for, uh, whether that be, you know, they're just, blindly applying for jobs or they're just not doing their due diligence. Um, and so reading the job description line by line uh, gives you leverage because you not only understand, you know, the core of what that company does or what industry they're in, uh, but you get uh, the best sense possible of the exact person that they're looking for. And a really great job description won't just only focus on the technical skills, but it'll also focus on some of those soft skills as well, right? So communication, uh, interpersonal, uh, high level of EQ, things of that nature. I got to ask, Ashton, can you tell when you speak to a candidate if they've only uh, read the job title and not read the job description? Is is that pretty obvious? Most definitely, Mac, uh, especially, you know, when you have someone who's been in uh, in the recruiting game as long as I have or longer. Uh, one core question that most people ask on the pre-screen call or somewhere during the interview uh, process is, hey, why our company? Why now? Uh, and that question can be something as simple as, Hey, you know, I know that you guys are in this, this industry and I want to stay in that. Or that answer, you know, from a candidate can be as detailed as, Hey, you know, I saw recently on an article that, you know, your company had in the news that you guys are focused in, uh, this area or this is the new initiative. And so, um, not only can you tell in their answer, uh, uh but also their tone of voice, their inflection, um, how it is that they answer that question, uh, and, and really be able to pinpoint, Hey, this person is really interested in this job specifically, uh, and not just any job that they can get out there. What are other ways that studying a job description thoroughly and, and knowing what's involved in the position, uh, how else can it give you leverage at that stage in the hiring process? Yeah. So I, I think during the interview process, uh, it, it allows you to tell stories uh, that are one-to-one -one, uh, and, and that the uh, hiring team is going to be able to understand, right? So, you know, if you're working in the same industry or staying within the same industry, you know, you can very easily speak one-to-one. -one, but even if you're not, you know, going and interviewing for jobs that are in the same industry and you're looking to transfer, uh, if you study the job description, if you know uh, not only what the core job is, but like I talked about, some of the those intangible skills that they're looking for, uh, it allows you to tell stories uh, that they can resonate with. Um, and I've always said that a great interviewer is a great storyteller. Um, they know how to walk you through uh, the details of that story and tell you how what they've done matches one-to-one -one with what you'd be asking them to do in that exact role. Terrific. We're going to take a break, Ashton. Stay with us. When we uh, come back, Ashton, McMillan will continue to share his advice on how to use leverage to get the job you want. Your resume is one of the best ways to leverage your experience and skills. Does your resume do this? Find out what the experts think. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Top resume will review your resume for free. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Learn how to use your resume to tell your career story or hire Top Resume to do it for you. Go to maxlist.org slash top resume. Now, let's get back to the show. We're back in the Maxlist studio. I'm talking with Ashton McMillan. He's a recruiter with experience in leadership and financial analysis who specializes in software engineering and technical positions. Ashton joins us from Saginaw, Michigan. Now, Ashton, before the break, we were talking about how to use leverage to get the job you want. And you were making the point uh, about the value of telling stories uh, when you are talking with an employer as a candidate and and. Uh, the benefits of, of telling stories. Can you talk more about that? Uh, how, why it's important for, as you said, for candidates to be good storytellers? Yes. Uh, tell, telling stories and having the ability to tell good stories during uh, the interview process, um, again, sets you head and shoulders above uh, any other candidate. Um, and it's something that, you know, could seem, you know, so simple or so small. Um, but when you, you take 
uh, when you take a concept or, or the details of something that you've done related directly to something that you may be doing in that role or something very similar and then can give the results or the conclusion, uh, if you will, of, you know, of what you did, how you did it and the results, uh, of what happened because, uh, of your action and your involvement in a project or a task or something like that. Um, it really, not only helps the interviewer see like, Hey, um, yeah, the interviewer see like, Hey, you know, this person really knows how to communicate. Uh, but it also, uh, lets them into, uh, it gives them a little bit more insight into your thought process, right? This is someone who can not only communicate very well, but the thought process is very, is very linear. Um, and whether they were speaking to somebody who was in the industry or somebody who wasn't, um, is in that story, right? And, and the power of that story uh, is in the details and the way that you tell that, uh, again, can give you leverage. And if it's one-to-one industry related, uh, then that's even that much better. What's your best advice about how to prepare in order to tell those stories? You mentioned looking for examples in your own background and then relating them to uh, uh, the needs of, of the employer where you might work. How can you how, how have you seen candidates research the needs of employers and dig up the information they need in order to, to make those connections so that they can have those stories ready uh, before the interview? Yeah, no, awesome question. So I think that the best way to do that, uh, and it, there is a such thing as, you know, coming into the interview overqualified, right? And, and sounding like a robot and just rattling off these random facts that have nothing to do with the question. Um, so I would caution candidates on not coming into the call being overqualified. But one thing, um, you know, that you can do to prepare to be a great storyteller is number one, uh, take some reflection time prior to the interview of like, Hey, what is my background? What impact have I had? Uh, how was I able to make that impact? Was it, you know, of my own sole effort? Was it a collaboration? Was it, you know, as a result of, you know, just the job and, and what I was, you know, hired to do and things of that nature? Uh, and then really just begin to, uh, put down bullet points, right? So again, not typing it out in paragraph form and, and coming in and being overqualified and reading it verbatim, but, you know, recounting your story, recounting your uh, experience, uh, making bullet points points that will, you know, trigger your mind to tell a certain story and, and make sure that you include certain details, um, I would say is probably the best thing. Also, another thing that I, you know, uh, that I would do and that I've done in the past is coming into an interview and not um, only having, you know, your resume uh, pulled up, you know, on one of your screens so you can see that uh, or in print if that's something that, you know, you're more accustomed to or you like better, but also, you know, in that very next tab next to that one, having the job description there as well. So again, you know, you're aligned in thought process, you're aligned when you look at your resume and then boom, oh yeah, the very job that you're applying for is also right there in front of you. So those are some of the things that I would do to prepare amongst a host of others. But when it comes to specifically telling stories, uh, I would say that that's the best way to prepare. What do you, in your experience, uh, stops candidates from sharing these kinds of stories in interviews? I would say uh, probably the fear of the fact that uh, the company or the person that's interviewing them doesn't care. Um, there is this notion that coming into an interview process, uh, that you have to, uh, remain openly professional. You have to remain buttoned up at all times. And I do believe that that is true, um, as far as like, you know, approaching everything in a professional manner, but there is a, uh, a very, um, something that's very infectious or something that's very powerful about being able to remain professional, but also relaxed enough to where uh, the company or the person that's interviewing you can get a true look into uh, who you are and begin to do that. And I think that the earlier in the process, the better. Uh, and I, I think that that is, um, you know, exactly why. You mentioned the not being too buttoned up and uh, overprepared as, as a common mistakes uh, candidates might make. Are there other in telling stories in an interview, are there other mistakes you've seen applicants make in your experience as a recruiter in, in telling stories? Mistakes in telling stories. I would say that uh, some candidates come in with, um, how do I say this? Come in too focused, uh, if you will. Uh, so, you know, they're good first five, 10 minutes of the interview, and then that's all they've prepared for. And then after that, uh, everything just seems to be, you know, repetition. So, um, you know, preparing 
enough stories or enough experiences to last the duration of the interview and not, you know, making the mistake of coming in with, oh, okay, here's this one story I'm going to focus on. And if they don't bite on that, or if that doesn't connect, like that's all that I have. Uh, but presenting yourself as very versatile and someone who has, uh, the experience, um, enough experience to, you know, relate directly to the business and is, uh, one of the mistakes that I would say in, in terms of storytelling. Another suggestion you have for using leverage to get the job you want is to prepare for negotiations before an offer comes. How does this help you, Ashton? Yeah, so I would say uh, right in line with what we've been talking about as far as preparing, you know, before the interview process by reading the job description, once you're in the interview, making sure that you're a great storyteller, uh, I would say, you know, the leverage that you create, uh, and that's also, you know, naturally there from when you apply to the position, uh, when it comes to, you know, offer negotiation and, you know, making sure uh, that you're recounting this, right? Making sure that you clearly understand if the job asks for three to five years and you have six, or if the job job as for a bachelor's degree and you have a master's degree, again, preparing yourself and, and making note of all of these things. So then that way, uh, whether, the, whether the job range is presented on the front end or presented on the back end, uh, you know, when the offer comes or maybe the conversation, a couple of conversations before the offer uh, that you've prepared and you've said, hey, you know, not only do I have the leverage of the experience? Not only, you know, was I able to come prepared with stories and experience and examples that align one to one, uh, but because of these things, this is why I deserve uh, the top of the market, or this is why I deserve uh, the top of uh, the salary range that's being presented. Uh, and so what you're doing and what a candidate should be doing is kind of building a case, right? Um, the idea of like, you know, uh, loading up, uh, if you will. So that way, when uh, the offer conversations and negotiations come about, uh, that you're prepared, you've done your homework, not only on the company, but how you align one-to-one -one with what it is they want. Uh, and, and you can assist them in understanding that as well. What kind of preparation do you recommend in order to make that case effectively when the offer does come? Uh, I would say the biggest thing is confidence. Uh, and I think confidence works both ways. Um, not only coming in right with a whole bunch of, you know, confidence, uh, for yourself, uh, but the confidence that you convey, uh, the company that you're going to work for, uh, will be able to feel that as well. Uh, and so, I would say that's one of the biggest things is having the confidence, knowing, and understanding what is it you deserve, not just based on some type of lofty goal you have or some type of, you know, lofty uh, quote that you heard somewhere one day, uh, but making it clear. Right. And I think that's where that confidence piece comes in. You know, it's, hey, I, I have the confidence that I need. We've talked about the things and, and clearly went over, you know, why it is that, you know, you or you know the candidate would be great for the position uh, and then carrying that right into the conversation. Conversation. Um, I would also, you know, uh, caution candidates to not have, you know, offer negotiations via email. Uh, if you're allowed the opportunity, uh, definitely having that conversation over a Zoom call or a phone call, if they're not willing to hop on video, uh, just so that everybody's on the same page. Sometimes, you know, I think we see it a lot during text messages. Uh, there's a lot that can be uh, picked up on or, or insinuated uh, in a written format. Uh, but if you're on video, if the person can see your tone, your inflection, uh, the smile on your face, the confidence that you bring to that call, uh, I think that is uh, definitely some things that would help uh, during that offer negotiation stage and continue to, you know, allow that leverage to uh, continue to, you know, ride itself throughout the process. Well, it's been a terrific conversation, Ashton. Now, tell us what's next for you. Yes. So what's next for me is uh, definitely just doing all that I can uh, within the talent and HR space uh, to really just change the face, right? Uh, and really make people begin to think differently. Uh, I think most times when people think about HR, it's just, oh, they hire and fire. When people think about recruiters or talent acquisition specialists or those many titles out there, they just think like, oh, they're out to, you know, get a quick buck. They're just out there to fill positions. Uh, but I've learned uh, through my course uh, in this field, you know, over the last four to five years, uh, that it's so much more than that uh, and that the job uh, that that person is uh, applying for could be the very position that changes their life or changes the trajectory of their career. Uh, and so making sure that everybody out there understands that, uh, making sure that I'm continuously sharing uh, tips and, and candidate tips and job seeker tips on LinkedIn and really just being that that candidate advocate, right, for anybody that reaches out to me with, with uh, questions or anything that they may be struggling with when it comes to, uh, you know, being a candidate because uh, it can be rough and 
And I've even had the thought in the past, and I'm pretty sure many other people have that, you know, uh, it, it's hard to have a full time job and be looking for a job because, uh, they're both full time jobs, right? And so, uh, you know, just really doing the best that I can to be that candidate advocate, make sure to stay engaged, uh, with my, uh, candidates, uh, both internally, you know, on my team, externally, things of that nature, and really just doing what all that I can to change, uh, the face and the overall idea behind what people think about when they think about people, uh, in the talent space in recruiting and HR in general. Terrific. Well, I know that listeners could learn more about you and your work as a recruiter by connecting with you on LinkedIn. And as always, if, uh, when they do reach out to you, I hope they'll mention they heard you on find your dream job. Now, Ashton, given all the useful tips you shared today, what's the one thing you want a listener to remember about how to use leverage to get the job you want? Yes, I would say that the the one thing that I want them to remember is uh, the leverage starts. Uh, the leverage conversation starts when you start it. Um, don't wait for uh, the employer or the person that you're going to work for to bring up, you know, kind of those conversations or you know, helping leaving it on them to help you understand why you're grateful for the job. I would say making sure that uh, you strategically apply for positions where you know without a shadow of a doubt based on something that you've read in the job description uh, that you can go into that conversation with confidence, ready to tell stories, and ready to help them understand and see uh, why it is that you're a great fit. If you do it the other way around, nine times out of 10, uh, it's not going to go well because when they get to that question of, hey, why us? why now? Uh, it has potential to become very, very awkward if you didn't prepare. So the leverage starts when that conversation begins in your head as you're reading that job description and as you're telling yourself why you're a good fit. Please, please do not wait for the employer or the company uh, that you're interviewing for to do that for you uh, because it, it typically uh, does not go well just from my experience. Make sure you never miss an episode of Find Your Dream Job. Subscribe to our free podcast newsletter. You'll get information about our guests and transcripts of every show. Go to maxlist.org slash newsletters. Again, that's maxlist.org slash newsletters. Next week, our guest will be Harsha Borelesa. He's the founder and host of the Reframe and Reset Your Career podcast. Previously, Harsha worked for more than 15 years in investment banking, management, and accounting. Even in a job seeker's market, it takes time to find the right position, sometimes months or even longer. And as time goes by, you may become frustrated, discouraged, and even overwhelmed as you look for work. Join us next week when Harsha Boralesa and I talk about how to avoid failure in your job search. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job. This show is produced by Max List. Susan Thornton Hoff schedules our guests and writes our newsletter. Lisa Kislin Barry Anderson manages our social media. Our sound engineer is Matt Fiorillo. Ryan Morrison at Podfly Productions edits the show. Dawn Mole creates our transcripts. And our music is by Freddie Trujillo. This is Mac Pritchard. See you next week.